This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. In the previous chapter, we saw a ton of work happen to the painting to get it ready for retouching. Well, almost. It first needs to go back onto a new stretcher. And if we take a close look at this stretcher support, we can see that it's pretty twisted, pretty distorted, and kind of wonky in all sorts of ways. And so this isn't going to suffice, because if I put the painting back on this stretcher, it's going to deform the surface, and we're going to see those bumps and those dips, and that's not a result that we want. Now, the easy answer would be to throw this stretcher away and buy a new one, but I'm not too keen on that, particularly when this is the only thing that's remaining of the original construction. Also, it's wood, and wood is repairable, infinitely so. So we can take a crack at repairing this, and if it doesn't work, then we can get a new support. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is use double-sided tape to adhere this stretcher bar support onto a piece of poplar that I've run through my table saw, and so I know that it's completely square. And the reason I'm going to do this is because I need to create a new, smooth, flat surface onto which the tacking edge can be put. So what I'm going to do is run this through my table saw. And as I run this through the table saw, you can see that I'm taking off about a half an inch. And wherever the saw cuts is going to be perfectly flat, perfectly true, and perfectly smooth. And you can get a better idea of just how much material I'm taking off and how smooth and straight that line is. Now this is important because I'm going to be using this new edge to adhere a new tacking edge onto the support. And so once I've done cutting it, you can see that even though the stretcher is still deformed in one way, we now have a perfectly flat and smooth surface on that direction. And so the next step is to rip down several pieces of oak that are going to create the new edge onto which the painting is going to be tacked. I'm going to add a little bit of a bevel here so that the new piece that I'm cutting here won't leave a dent or a mark on the canvas. And then I'm going to be using wood glue to adhere this to the original support. Now this does not need to be reversible. This in fact I want to be permanent, so I'm just using a standard wood glue. I'm going to roll it on, make sure that I have good coverage, not using anything technically advanced like my fingers. I'm just using a little rubber brayer. And then I will glue it together on a flat table. And what this is going to do is create a completely square and completely straight new surface onto which the painting will be tacked. And so once I do this for all four sides, I can clean them up and trim off all the excess to make sure that they fit into the joints. And then I'll go to some hand cleanup work after that. And using a sharp Japanese chisel, I can remove any of the excess just to make sure that these uh, new tenons fit into the mortises smoothly. I don't want them to catch and I uh, want to clean it up just a little bit more with hand tools, get it a little bit more refined. Even though nobody's going to see this, it's still important that it looks good and that it fits well. And so now, with that new edge adhered, we can see that even though the original wood still has a twist and a bump right in the middle, right about there, there you can see it, the new edge that I've added is straight and doesn't have any deformations. And that's important because that's what the canvas is going to attach to. And we want to make sure that that is smooth, straight, and without deformations. I'm going to put these pieces together. And because of the construction of this stretcher, because it's not an American-made stretcher, it doesn't have a 45-degree uh, joint. So I have to trim off a little bit of the new piece of edge that I've made, and I've got to inlay or add on a new piece of beveled wood to match the profile of the piece that I added in the perpendicular stretcher bar. I know it sounds really complicated, but if you see what I'm doing right here, it all makes sense. I want to make sure that that lip goes around the entire stretcher. So with the stretcher all assembled and squared up, I can lay the canvas on top of it and begin the stretching process. 
Now this canvas has an interleafed lining, so there's a piece of PET film in between the original and new canvas, which makes it extremely robust and really durable, but I still want to be careful because it's a big painting and I've done a lot of work thus far and I really don't want to drop it. So I can orient the painting as I need, make sure that it is in its correct position and that none of the image area is getting clipped, and then I can start the tacking process. And I'm going to be using blued steel upholstery tacks and a magnetic tacking hammer. And I'll start in the middle of each edge, laying down a couple of tacks, and then move to the opposite edge. Now, because this painting has an interleaf, it's not really all that important or even possible to put a lot of tension on the canvas because that interleaf prevents the canvas from stretching. So even as I pull it, it's not really flexing. Now I'm spitting tacks here, and that's a technique whereby the tacks are held in the cheek and you use your tongue and lips to bring them to the front and then use the magnetic hammer to take them out of your mouth and then put them into whatever it is you're tacking. And this is something that definitely takes a lot of practice. You don't want to swallow a whole bunch of tacks and end up in the emergency room. Um, so you start small with one or two tacks, and then after you've done it enough, you, you get a good rhythm and you get a good feel for how to do it. And this is something that upholsters have been doing for hundreds of years, so it's nothing I've invented or anything special, really. And so once I've gotten the entire painting tacked on, I will fold over the tacking edge and secure it with some smaller tacks. And you can see that I'm covering up the new piece of wood that I've added. And so for all intents and purposes, nobody's ever gonna know that I worked on this stretcher, that I repaired it and put all of that work into it. And that's okay. It's not necessary that anybody sees that. What is necessary is that it provides good support and also that it's straight and true and that it doesn't deflect the painting. So that's the most important thing. Now I'm gonna go ahead and tidy up the back and I'm going to insert some new oak keys that I've cut because the originals were lost, they, they, they were simply gone. And I've drilled little holes in them so that I can bind them with some fishing line. Yeah, so this is uh, something that I do so that the keys don't get lost. Now, even though I did a lot of work filling in the painting and getting rid of all those voids, I wanna to check to make sure that everything is very smooth and flat. This painting doesn't have a lot of impasto, and you can see that a raking light will reveal any deviations or dips or bumps that need to be further addressed. So even though I've gone over this several times, I'm going to go over it again, and I'm going to find any area where the fill-in material has sunk or too much has been removed, like right here, and I'm going to fill it in again. And I'm gonna overfill it, I'm gonna remove the excess, and then I'm gonna do it again, and then I'm gonna do it again. This is one of those cases where I really, really, really need to make sure that the painting has no deviations because it's a really smooth piece. And so any bumps, any divots are really gonna show. There are some things that I can do later on to kind of cheat that, but this is the time when I can do the most amount of work to make sure that I get the best results. And I'll use my fingertips and the impressions of my fingerprints like a sandpaper to remove any of the excess buildup material. Not only is it effective, but it also lets me feel how much I need to add or remove. And you can't really do that with sandpaper or a sponge or anything. Now, when I mentioned there were some things I could do to cheat any of the bumps, this is one of them. And this is an isolation layer. And again, this isn't to prevent my retouching from touching the original painting. It's more to simulate what the colors are going to look like because holy cow, they are different when they are varnished with this resin than when they are unvarnished, like right here. But this resin, because it is thicker, it's less viscous, it's going to sit above the surface and it's not going to flow around. It effectively is gonna help level out any of those small deviations, any of those little nicks or uh, little bumps that I wasn't able to remove or fill in with the fill-in medium. And so adding this is really important because not only does it give me an accurate representation of what I need to be retouching against, but it gives me a smooth and level surface onto which I can place that retouching. And this resin is archival, it is ultraviolet stabilized, and it's fully reversible with a solvent that I've tested on this painting and will do no harm. So this is nothing that is permanent, and if it ever needs to be removed, it's fairly easy to do so. 
And as I put this on, you can see just how different the painting looks already. It's almost a little bit of a spoiler because this kind of takes away from the final varnish process, but look at how beautiful those colors are. I mean, it's a far cry from when we first saw the painting when it came into the studio, huh? And now I'm gonna switch from analog to digital work, and I'm gonna go online to see if I can find any images of this painting. And were Guido Reni alive today, you bet he'd have a website, because he'd wanna share his work with the world. I mean, if you're an artist and you're working in a vacuum and nobody sees your work, does it even really exist? And there's no easier way to get your online presence established than with Squarespace, where with a few clicks, you can build a beautiful, modern, mobile-friendly website. You can import your images from other platforms. You can create a portfolio. You can create about pages, contact pages. You can even put in an e-commerce solution if you want to sell your paintings from your website and skip the gallery scene altogether. So head over to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash baumgartner to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So all of what I said about having an online presence is also really important because if I ever have to work on your paintings, it'll be really nice to be able to see what they look like before they were damaged. And so I'm going to some archives, and I'm going to download some pictures of the original Aurora painting by Guido Reni because I can't really fly to Italy. It's not in my client's budget. And I'm gonna bring them into Photoshop and I'm going to start manipulating them so that they match the scale and size of my painting. And the painting I'm working on isn't by Guido Reni and it's not an exact copy, but I'm gonna work from the original because the artist was working from the original and frankly, that's all I have to work from. So with some printouts, uh, and the painting all ready for retouching, I can begin. And I'll get these printouts up on a poster board and get them next to the painting so that I can reference them as I'm working. And I can always go back to the computer and look at more if I need, but having them right in front of me is really helpful. And now, with a painting of this size and this scope, of course it deserves a brand new palette. And I'm using retouching paints that are designed for conservators, they have no oil as their binder medium. They use a resin, which means that in the future, if they ever need to come off, they can, because the resin is soluble in solvent. So with all my colors laid out and a new brush, because of course this painting and this palette deserve a new brush, I can start to mix colors. And I'm gonna start with the blue because no reason, I just wanna start with the blue. Actually, starting with the blue is a deliberate choice because it's a color that I can mix pretty easily. Uh, aside from skin colors, flesh tones, blues are one of the things that seem to work in my brain and my eye easier than other colors. There's a high concentration of white in blues, so they are more opaque and less transparent. Uh, and it's one of the areas that I'm going to use to familiarize myself with this painting and how the artist painted it. So I'm going to start blocking out some of the shapes and just give myself some rudimentary lines and guides for the retouching that I need to do. And of course, if I don't like anything that I'm doing, I can remove it. But at this stage, it's, it's so preliminary that there's really no need. I can just retouch over it. And these guides are not permanent and they don't need to be all that accurate. They're just crutches at this stage to help my eye see what should be there instead of what is there. And I'm going to start with the darker colors because it's easier to make a lighter color from a darker color than it is to go the other way. And I'm going to work in the shadows and I'm just going to slowly build up the color and get it to a point where I think it's going to look good and it's integrated. And I had a long discussion with my client about what type of retouching they wanted on this painting. And after talking to them quite a bit, we decided, I mean, it was pretty clear that they wanted a fully integrated Mimitech retouching where all of the damage was made to disappear. Because of the extent of the damage, this really wasn't an option for my client uh, to use anything else. My client didn't want to see any of this damage. So this is what I'm doing. I'm making it all go away. And I suppose this is controversial and some other conservators or art historians or people who are not in my studio working with my client on this painting may have opinions about this being inappropriate, that I am supposing what would be there. And 
To that, my answer is, well, we do know what was there because we have the original, or we have photographs of the original painting. In addition, all of this can be undone. So if it ever lands in their studios, they are welcome to take the solvent and wipe all of this off and take a crack at it themselves. Ultimately, though, I have to make my client happy, and my client wants this painting to look whole. So that's what I'm going to do. And this is going fairly well. I'm actually pretty happy with how easily this is coming, and I, I'm chuckling only because at this point I remember having a distinct feeling of, well, this isn't going to be so bad. I don't know what you were worried about. Look at how easy this is going. This painting is going to be a breeze. Sit back, relax, enjoy yourself. Oh my gosh. If only, if I only knew then what I know now about just how much work it was going to go into this painting, um, I don't think I would be so cheery and uh, perhaps naive. But don't worry, I survived. Uh, and after getting warmed up on an area that I really liked retouching, I switched to an area that, well, suffice it to say I wasn't terribly excited about. It's not that I don't like feet, they're just really hard to paint. And there are plenty of artists who don't like painting feet. In fact, there was an American artist, Adam Emery Albright, kind of an American Impressionist, who made a career of painting his kids, beautiful scenes of childhood, on his farm, in the woods, in the fields. But the one thing that's really interesting if you look at the body of his work is that for all the times he painted his kids, there are almost no feet in his paintings. That's because the kids are always in knee-high grass or behind a log or wading through a stream. And it's because Adam Emery Albright was bad at painting feet. Now, I'm not talking like he painted them okay but not great or kind of painted them a little rougher on the edges. He was bad, B-A-D, at painting feet. And he knew it. <laughs> And he said, you know what? I'm not going to waste my time and my energies practicing painting feet. Who cares? Nobody likes feet. So I'm just going to stop painting them. I'm going to hide them. And frankly, it is a good thing he did because I've seen some of the paintings where he tried painting feet and whew, they are rough. But, you know, trying to create a foot, a beautiful foot, is not my job here as a conservator. Maybe as an artist it would be, but I'm not tasked with that. What I have to do is recreate a foot that matches the existing painting. And so the artist that created this painting was looking at Guido Reni's painting. So in effect, I'm trying to create a copy of a copy. And while I do have the original photographs to look from, from Guido Reni's painting, and I also have the other feet to look at, it's a delicate balance between trying to recreate Rennie's foot and trying to recreate this artist's foot. Now, luckily, I don't have to create the perfect foot. I can use all of the clues from the artist's other feet to match this one to them. And that is, if there are weird shapes or weird shadows or weird anatomy on his feet, I can copy them. And even if it doesn't look right to the naked eye, as long as it looks right in the context of this painting, then that's a job well done. And so there are some things about this foot that already I think are kind of weird. That bump on the top of the foot looks pretty big, but there are big bumps on all of the other feet. So if I didn't have that bump, well, then this foot would stand out and wouldn't read correctly. So I'm going to just work on blocking this out and slowly building up the color and the shape and the volume and go back and work on it a little bit more and then go back and work on it a little bit more. And there's no magic to this. There's no secret. It's just a lot of practice. And I guess this is one of those times where I had paid better attention in my anatomy classes and my drawing 101, but you know, such is life. So I'm going to work on this and I'm probably going to take a break from retouching this foot pretty soon because I, I want to stop at a positive point. That is a point where I feel good about the work that I've done and I can take a break and come back the next day and take a look at it. It's always good to look at your light, your work in a different light. Literally, because sometimes the light changes the way you see the color, but also because you might decide that it's not good. 
or there's something about it that you don't like. And so after waiting a day or two and coming back, I didn't think the foot was big enough. It just looked too small for the figure and too small for the painting. And trust me, I measured. It was too small. So I'm going to start over. And this is one of those cases that I'm not terribly happy that I have to start over, but as a conservator, as a retoucher, this is par for the course. And there are many times where you spend a lot of energy, a lot of time, a lot of emotional and intellectual investment working on an area of a painting, doing the retouching, only to come back the next day and realize that it's pretty lousy or that you just miss the mark a little bit. And frankly, better that you notice that yourself than the client or your boss or somebody like that. And there's no problem. It happens to everybody. There's never a time when a conservator has hit the mark perfectly all the time. There is no 100%, 100% of the time. And anybody who tells you that is just pulling your leg or your foot. So after blocking out the foot again and deciding on a larger shape, I can once again start creating the foot. And this is a little bit like painting in that I'm starting off by blocking out color and volume and then going in and adding some of the detail, but it's that's where the similarities end. Because of course, I'm using a really tiny brush that very few artists would use. It's not really efficient and it doesn't give you the ability to blend. But these paints don't really allow for blending. You see, because they don't have oil in them, they have a resin and a solvent, they dry pretty quickly. In fact, once I take my brush off the canvas and then get more paint and come back to the canvas, that paint is pretty much dry. And so blending really isn't an option. I have to rely on laying down lots of variations of color, sort of pixelating it or dithering it in hopes that your eye will see it and blend it in together. And that's really what a lot of conservation and retouching is about, is tricking your eye into seeing something that may not actually be there or may not be complete. Because of course, I'm not the artist here and I don't know what the artist really wanted. I can suppose because I have other feet to work from and the original, but I'm just trying to give a fair approximation or facsimile of the artist's other foot so that when you see it, you don't stop on it and say, well, where's the foot? Or, gee, that is a terrible foot. Now, upon close inspection, you will probably be able to tell that that's not an original foot, but that's not what I'm going for. I'm not trying to trick you. Well, I am. I'm trying to trick your eye and your brain. I mean, I guess I'm trying to trick you. Okay, I take it back. But not in any nefarious way. I'm trying to put the piece together so that you can see it as a whole. So I'm trying to trick you into seeing the painting not the detail. See the, see the forest for the trees, so to speak. So having done a little bit more work, I'm again at a point where I'm satisfied with what I've done and I'm going to take a break. And I think I worked a little bit more on this foot, but nothing major. I certainly didn't recreate it. I was satisfied and happy to call it a day. And now one area of the painting that I was really excited about retouching was Apollo's face, because the tear was pretty catastrophic and cut right through it. And so as I work to put him back together, I'm going to step away and give you guys something to listen to. And I can't think of anything better than Sinding's Rustles of Spring, because of course, spring comes after the darkness of winter, and Aurora is the dawn, and she's leading Apollo surrounded by light into the world. So, I guess it's all kind of fitting, huh?
And so now I am done. And suffice it to say, I am delighted because this painting was a beast. There was so much retouching. And while I enjoyed it and it was really fun, I am glad for it to be over. I don't think I could retouch anymore. I'd lose my mind. So now it's on to varnishing. I'm going to be applying my ultraviolet stable synthetic fully reversible resin varnish two ways. I'm going to first start with the brush and I'm going to apply the first coating just to get a nice even base. And I want to see what the painting looks like. It's always a question when you're applying over another resin like I applied earlier as to what this resin is going to look like. And so by applying the first coat with brush, I'll get an approximation of how it's all going to come together. Now I'm pretty deliberate about the way I apply varnish, and this is just force of habit having applied varnish to thousands upon thousands of paintings. I charge the brush fully, and that means I soak up a lot of varnish into the brush, and then I start to apply it in a very deliberate, even manner. I'm not swirling it around, I'm not moving haphazardly, I'm just going back and forth in nice even brush strokes to get good coverage. This varnish isn't going to dry instantaneously, so I don't really need to worry about the first pass. I'm just really trying to deposit the varnish all over the entire painting with this pass. And then I'll make several other passes, one going horizontally, then one vertically, a diagonal if I need back to horizontal, back to vertical, however many and however uh, many different directions as I see fit. And those are the passes that I will use to distribute the varnish evenly and to get a nice sheen. And so you can see I'm just going back and forth, lapping over my previous brush strokes, and just ensuring that I'm distributing the varnish evenly and that I'm getting nice coverage. Because the varnish needs to be uniform if I want it to look good, and of course, that's the name of the game. So back and forward, back and forward, and I can just reach across the painting, which is nice. And once I'm done, I can let it dry. Now at this point, I took a look at the painting and I decided that there were some spots that I wasn't completely happy with. And this often is the case. Sometimes there are little areas that the color just looks a little off. And you can see right here in this blue, some of the dark blue I applied was just a little too dark and it caught my eye. So I'm going back in on top of the varnish and I'm just adding a little bit of light blue there just to make sure that it doesn't stand out as it did before. Now, hopefully I don't have to do this all over the painting, but a little bit is not the end of the world. And now I can apply the final coat of varnish. And I'm using an HVLP system, so high volume, low pressure, and I'm spraying the varnish on again in very deliberate, even passes. And I'm actually a little bit higher up from the surface than is recommended when applying paint or other surface coatings. And that's because I want this varnish to start to dry in the air. As the varnish is atomized, it becomes a fine mist, and as that mist travels through space, some of the solvent that makes it a, a liquid will evaporate, and some of that resin will start to crystallize. And I want those kind of tacky, sticky crystals to land on the surface of the painting, because it's going to give it a very glittery, kind of gorgeous, shimmery effect. Not glossy, just glittery. And it's really hard to explain, and it's really hard to capture on camera because you can't quite see how the light reflects. But if done right, it gives an effect that's just gorgeous. And on this painting, I'm going over it with my badger hair brush just to remove any loose uh, varnish that dried in the air and didn't stick to the painting. I don't want it dusty. And let's take a look back at the painting as it arrived in the studio. Tons of paint loss big tears and holes, missing canvas, and of course, it was filthy. But as we see the transformation from before to after, we can see the image start to come together. We can start to appreciate the painting as a whole. We can see just how gorgeous and lively the scene is and how beautiful and vibrant those colors are. I mean, it's stunning. And this painting required a ton of work not just on the front end before I could begin putting it back together, but on the back end as well. And it goes without saying that this 
was probably one of the most fun projects I've worked on in a long while. Not because it was any technique I've never used or any material that was new to me, but just because it was a really beautiful painting, a really large painting, an impressive painting that really required me to step up and pull out all the tricks I had to put it back together. And frankly, I think it turned out wonderfully, and I couldn't be happier with the end result. And thank you for joining along with me as I've worked to put this painting back together. As always, you can go ahead and subscribe and keep an eye out for more videos.